Hey guys, um, so welcome back. My name's Tim Stevenson. Um, I'm a DTME working on Nexus switching in the data center networking group, uh, focused on largely on system and switch architectures, but also focusing on telemetry, both hardware and software telemetry, and Network Insights is our platform for, among other things, consuming uh, telemetry data from our switching infrastructure. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. And you know, feel free to ask any questions. Um, so I think this is a little, you know, refresher on what I think Jur covered earlier, which is uh, Insights is essentially an extension to the functionality of the base controller, which is DCNM. And by the way, the same Insights extensions that work on DCNM also work on APIC. So whether you're running ACI or standalone, you get the same kind of operational look and feel from our advisor and resources Insights apps. So these plug into the base controller. They extend the, the base functionality, all the easy fabric stuff and, uh, that, that Lucas covered, and give you additional screens and views into how the network is operating um, and how you might interact with the network. Um, so there's advisor and there's resources. We're going to cover each of those, and I'm going to give you a little demo of each. Um, we'll start with advisor. Advisor sometimes gets short shrift just because um, it's not as whiz bang as some of the streaming telemetry and the hardware telemetry, which people like to see flow data and so forth. I'll show you some of that. But what advisor is really focused around is kind of network lifecycle management and alerting you to issues um, that uh, ha affect the specific configured network that you have deployed. So instead of um, you know, slogging through a long email of all the P-certs that Cisco has announced over the last month um, and trying to figure out, does this apply to the 50 different switch models I have deployed or the specific uh, configurations that I have deployed or the software that I have deployed, we will essentially tailor a list of notices and alerts um, that is specific to the hardware you have deployed, the software versions you have de deployed, and uh, the features that you've configured on, on those systems. Um, there's also a focus on kind of actionable recommendations. So not only, hey, this is a problem that we see with something that you have deployed, but also how should you go about you know, remediating or resolving that, that issue. Um, and you'll see some of that in, in the demo. Uh, in terms of kind of the mechanics of how we get uh, that information, there's really two components. First is the on-prem portion, NIA, as we call it, advisor, runs on top of DCNM. It's on, an on-premises solution today. There's no pure cloud version or anything like that, although you know, we are uh, entertaining that as a possibility. Uh, but we're basically going to interact with the switches in the network, pull down configuration, and, and essentially show tech type data to get a complete dump of what is going on on those switches based on uh, the software and features that you have configured. And then we are connecting to Cisco's cloud using the Cisco Intersight platform to download essentially a dump of all the, the digitized signatures for known issues, field notices, end of sale notices. Um, we can alert you when there's new software releases that have come out um, and, and so forth. And so there is a cloud component. As of today, this is a kind of a unidirectional data flow. It only pulls data from Cisco's cloud, we don't send anything back to Cisco's cloud. That is definitely something that we're looking at in, in future as a possibility is um, maybe a kind of tighter integration there uh, in terms of interacting with customer support, for example, or um, advanced services, or just getting kind of anonymized data of how people are using uh, the networks that they have deployed, what are the most commonly deployed features, and that sort of thing. That's not there right now, but the, the mechanism certainly exists uh, where we, we could enable that. Um, just a little bit more detailed view of what I just showed you. You know, we're pulling data from the, the switches. We're pulling it into NIA. NIA is an on-prem solution right now, riding on top of DCNM or the APIC. Um, and, uh, and then we're interacting with the cloud over here to pull down all these different uh, pieces of information from, from the cloud. Inside NIA, this is a microservices architecture. There's basically a bunch of containers that run different functions and, and uh, uh, serve different purposes. So we have kind of an ingest engine for pulling in the switch data. We store all that in a database as, as we do all the cloud data. And then we have correlation and analytics engines that go and compare those things and figure out what from the big giant data dump from Cisco is actually relevant to show you. Um, and then we kind of render that for you in the GUI. Any questions on advisor? 
I can. This is a subscri subscription service? Yeah, so uh, Jura can maybe comment further on licensing and how you uh, kind of have to pay for that, but it is a subscription-based license for the Insights apps. It seems like it would almost behoove you guys to just give it away for free because of the EOL, uh, EOS type stuff that you could identify in a customer environment. You could yeah. turn around and say, hey, you guys need to upgrade your boxes. So Yeah, no, that's a very good uh, observation. I think there is actually an effort um, around kind of giving a teaser type yep. version where you get some base functionality and then probably you know end of sale announcement is a good example not just for for switching hardware which could obviously you know kind of churn the installed base in terms of you know people having older switching but also as you'll see in the demo maybe getting people onto more current software um, and yeah. uh, and I can show you in the demo why you might want to do that um, Here's a question for you <laughs> yeah for high security environments yeah <laughs> Uh, yeah, you probably know where I'm going with this. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, is there a version of this where I could say, go grab data, plug it in somewhere, right. get a readout, get something, go back and grab what I wanted and come back? Yeah, it's a good question, and yeah, and it has been asked. Um, as of now, the there is no mechanism for that type of environment. We understand that there are, you know, kind of federal and other type of situations where it's an air-gapped network. Um, the proposal is essentially to kind of have a tarball or something that you could download right. the data dump from Cisco, you know, carry it into your uh, secure environment and then run it on an NIA that's installed in that secure environment and does not have a cloud connection. So that that's definitely something that we're looking at. I, it does not exist as it is today, but that would okay. be the solution. Yeah, because I deal with, with a lot of that, and that's one of the that's one of the things that comes up with a lot of the tools now. It's not yeah. just you guys. I mean, yeah. you've got a few tools, but there's also a lot of other vendors that have similar tools yeah. where all the new capabilities and all the new things and all the new licensing models, and we get to check this and do that and whatever, and it's like cloud connection, cloud yeah. connection, cloud connection, and nope, sorry, can't. Yeah. Uh, so then it becomes an issue. Yeah, we, we know that there are customers yeah. like that, and I, I think it's a fairly simple problem to address in this particular case, sure. um, but I, I don't think the work has been done yet. I think Jura is shaking his head no, um, but, you know, we can, we will get there, I'm sure, eventually. We know you just uh, I feel like this is on. almost a uh, digital sales engineer. A really smart digital sales engineer. Yeah, a, a lot of times people ask, well, can I get rid of my advanced services uh, contract then? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I will answer no, you, you cannot, but maybe this frees up your advanced services engineer to do kind of more interesting and important work than slogging through a bunch of release notes to find known bugs. Um, you know, we already know that the bug affects what they're running. Why? pay an advanced services engineer to do that when we can just have this system do that and they can go and do something more interesting you know, and more useful relative to your network. Um, so this is a, a, an instance of data center network manager. Um, there's a fabric there. Uh, I, I'm just going to navigate over here to what we call the applications tab, um, theoretically. Of course. What is going on here? Demo gods are not being kind to me, guys. Let me see if my other setup is working better. Okay. I feel like you could give away the free version of all the things that you need to you need to change, uh, and just not how to change them, um, and then say, okay, well, good luck. Yeah. Um, of course, all this stuff is acting crazy now. Okay, here we go. I was trying so, to buy you some time. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate <laughs> that. Yeah. Okay, so this is a network in insights advisor, and basically the idea with, with both advisor and resources is you kind of are initially dropped into a main dashboard that is intended to bubble up the main issues right into your face. So you can go and browse through all the data and find all the tabular you know, uh, lists of field notices and advisories and bugs and and P-certs and so forth, but the idea here is just, it's in your face, I've got two critical devices, um, I've got two critical advisories, three moderate advisories, I've got various issues by severity, it looks like I've got a whole bunch of P-certs here. Um, and so you can kind of insert into the, the data through any one of those, those mechanisms, or you can just come over here and browse through 
them uh, as you see fit. So you know, here I've got a whole bunch of P certs that um, are are kind of clearly a problem, and these are just a bunch of vulnerabilities. They all apply to the switches in the fabric, and I can click through on any one of them. It'll give me all the details of that particular field notice, what the you know the symptom and conditions and possible workarounds and so forth, and then you can see that NIA has created an advisory that relates to this P cert and it shows you which devices are affected, right? Um, so I can go ahead and view that advisory, and it's sa saying the recommended version is 703i76, and um, you know these switches are running downrev software. So all these P-certs, and you can see there's, there's basically like 50, you know, five pages, 10 rows each, uh, 50 different P-certs that apply to the software I'm running. So, you know, so much for camping on, you know, the old uh, i7-1 release. I've got 50 P-certs that I'm vulnerable to in that release. And so, you know, going back to the, the idea of kind of convincing customers to move ahead, um, from a software release perspective, you could probably pre prevent a lot of pain by going to the latest i7-6 uh, i7 here and resolving all of those P-certs, right? We can also run an upgrade impact, so we can tell you if I go from I-71 to I-76, will that be a disruptive or non-disruptive upgrade? Um, so, you know, for I have some feature or, or function enabled here on LEAF-1 or it's a particular platform that does not support a, a non-disruptive upgrade for some reason. Um, so you can get a sense of, like, how impactful it would be to resolve this problem. I mean, obviously, a software upgrade could potentially be uh, be fairly impactful, depending. Um, so, so that's just an example. Um, I, I can drill down into any of these other things. There's there's bugs that are identified, and it tells you you know which, which versions are affected, how many devices are affected. You can see things like anomalies, which are essentially flagging, typically flagging things like uh, violated best practice configurations, like you don't have strong password checking uh, enabled, right? So people can use password one, two, three as their password or something. Um, you know, I've set a long exec timeout. I haven't got authentication on my NTP server, that sort of thing. So um, just, you know, making sure that you're following Cisco best practices when you're going and configuring these switches. So, so a lot of this stuff is low hanging fruit. I mean, it is stuff that an advanced services engineer would kind of be compelled to tell you about, but we can tell you in a very automated fashion specifically to what you have running and free up that resource if you have it for something a lot more useful, right, than telling you to enable strong password checking. So I'm just curious about the yep. the TAC assist that you have yep. down there at the bottom. Yep. Is that you know traditionally we you know we go do our show TAC and we get on a WebEx and we dump those to a TAC engineer and all of that. What does the TAC assist do beyond those things that we've traditionally done? Yeah. So I, I mean the TAC assist is um, at the moment not as sophisticated as what you just described. It essentially lets you uh, collect logs from a subset of the switches in the network and stores them locally on prem on the uh, on the NIA compute cluster. Okay. It would be incumbent on you to... So it's a quicker way it's to It's just get a quicker way to just then you rather than SSH'ing, SSHing in and, in and, and so. FTPing and all that. That's yeah, right, okay, yeah. So it. it will collect all that for you, but then you still have to go to, you know, the, the TAC portal and open a case and attach those. Clearly with the Intersight connection and the possibility of a bi-directional data flow, it only makes sense that kind of directionally we would you know, kind of grease the skids as far as that process, right? I mean, automatically uh, pull logs, automatically open a case, uh, could, uh, and, the, and potentially the TAC engineer could even say, hey, I want to go visit these three devices and pull these three outputs that, uh, that I need to further diagnose the problem. I mean, that would be with your consent, obviously, but, um, but you know, potentially the TAC could have a way into those devices to get additional uh, information from them without you having to go and collect all that yourself. Right? Gotcha. So, yeah. so with Network Insights, are we seeing <clears throat> just bugs and out-of-date software and soon-to-be-end-of-life hardware, or are we seeing um, 
like actual anomalies and attacks as well? Yeah, so it's it's definitely not like anomaly detection in maybe the traditional sense or the maybe more commonly used sense. Um, so um, these anomalies are not related to security per se in that, you know, there's some kind of probe of the switch or there's, you know, uh, uh, Build beacon. Yeah, whatever. just a any type of security type anomaly. I think the the word anomaly is maybe a little heavily loaded, and it doesn't really mean what it does in other contexts in networking. In this particular case, um, so yeah, I mean the answer is no. It does not do that type of detection. The network doctor. Yeah, a network doctor. Thank I'll you. Check. That's good. That's that's uh, quotable. Um, all right, so I, that's probably enough on, on advisor. Let me talk about resources now. So resources is more focused around analysis and correlation of telemetry data. And we can collect both software and hardware telemetry data. Um, the hardware telemetry data does have a, obviously, hardware dependency. So some switches support it, some do not. Whereas the software telemetry is essentially a baseline NXOS function, pretty much every up-to-date shipping Nexus switch supports streaming software telemetry. Um, but the idea is to coalesce all this telemetry data and you know, run some analytics against it and uh, give you some insights into what's going on in the network. Uh, just like with NIA, we're kind of focused on bubbling up the problem areas to you right away so that you don't have to slog through reams of data in order to find um, what's going wrong, uh, and then allow you to drill down into the specifics if you need to see those. Uh, so just like with NIA, we need to get data. In this case, we are pulling both software and, if, if available, hardware telemetry off the switching infrastructure. Um, uh, Network Insights Resources takes care of configuring the switches to send the system what needs to be sent for us to do what we need to do. So you don't need to go in and figure out which objects and which CLIs and, and so forth you need to stream out. NIR takes care of that, and I'll, I'll show you that in, in a second. Um, so the software telemetry, that's going to give us control plane visibility, more or less anything that uh, is visible when you log into a switch and look at show commands is available for streaming. Um, essentially, if it can be sent as structured data, uh, which the vast majority of our CLI outputs can, then we can stream it. Um, and then on top of that, we have hardware telemetry, which is streamed directly from our ASICs. These are Cisco custom silicon platforms. This is the Nexus 9K cloud scale platforms uh, support hardware telemetry. And we'll talk about what some of those telemetry mechanisms actually are. So we often get asked, before you guys ask, I should have just let you guys ask this question, but um, you know, wh which do I need, hardware or software telemetry? And the answer really is ideally both. You'll, you'll take software where you can get it, but the hardware adds visibility into areas that you simply don't have visibility into um, through any other means. Obviously, the, uh, the switch software has visibility into what control plane protocols you're running, you know, what's the environmental state of, of the switch, um, you know, what does the ARP table look like, uh, what are my multicast routes, and so forth. But in terms of programming the hardware, I might put a 10 slash 8 prefix into the hardware. Software has no idea what conversations are happening over that prefix because the ASIC takes care of that data plane forwarding over the the various prefixes you've programmed. And so that's where hardware telemetry can give you a view into the conversations that are happening inside the silicon and that the control plane knows nothing about. And so obviously those are kind of complementary uh, points of view and can give you different information depending on what problem you're trying to solve. So this is the software telemetry. It'll give you control plane protocol information, interface counters, uh, resource utilization. How are my TCAMs looking? Is the route table filling up? Am I running out of um, you know, some configurable resource or some hardware resource, uh, as well as environmental stuff? And we're delivering that in structured format uh, in Google Protobufs over gRPC. So we do open a TCP session to the switch, and we have a persistent TCP uh, connection to the switch to transmit this software telemetry data. Um, as I said, this is really the baseline for NXOS devices. More or less all our NXOS devices today can support streaming software telemetry, and so you at least get this level of visibility into any Nexus infrastructure that you have. 
So what kind of alerting does it do on this information? Will it baseline your <laughs> environment for you? Yeah. And then, uh, you know, based on standard deviation, yeah. it'll, it'll alert you on that? That's exactly right. Yeah, alert. I mean, that is one of, the, one of the mechanisms that we use is kind of um, we'll have uh, baselines for various metrics that we're monitoring, and then based on a rate of change, for example, we can alert you. It won't be like, a, you know, the sky is falling type alert. It'll be more like you might want to be aware this interface just, you know, increased in the last minute, you know, 20% higher utilization. Is that normal? You know, the system doesn't really know that necessarily. It, it can learn that over time to some degree. I will point out that the data retention for this system right now is not, you know, uh, ex excessively long. It's roughly 30 days for software telemetry and seven days for hardware telemetry. Um, that's largely a function of disk, um, and uh, you know we're looking at ways that we might allow people to kind of um, archive the data that Network Insights has collected and move it off the Insights platform itself, and potentially retrieve it if they if you want to do like something forensically for something that happened two months ago or consume three months ago, different, uh, uh, or different consume it into a different system, which is yet another request that we have. Um, so we are looking at mechanisms like that, but as of now, it's roughly a month of, of historical data, which, you know, like if you're in, you know, kind of retail or something, a month is not going to reveal to you patterns that might be completely normal, like, you know, Christmas comes and suddenly all the traffic spikes 50% or something. So th there's no additional streaming capabilities off the platform today? You can't, I mean, if you're already running Kafka or something like that, you can Yeah, so uh, let me show you the next sli or, uh, a slide. Just a few from here, and okay. I'll address that that topic. So, just to real quick, and you can move slides is fine. But as I was gonna say, you, you're you're retaining your detail stuff about thirty days based on the storage, like you said. Yeah, yeah. But looking at things, what I would think of as common as far as your average mm -hmm. max min, mm -hmm. is that rolling then? As, is that... as of now, it is not. So you're, you're you're talking about maybe like a digest or something, or kind of. Uh, well, uh, a digest, but I mean, I can I can even say you know, just baseline, if you will, but, you know, over the last 30 days, here's your average, here's the highest peak you've yeah, ever had. So that that we can it. show you. Yeah. It's just if if the pattern that you're, that we're considering normal would never extend beyond 30 days. That's my point. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, um, and then we have hardware telemetry, and this is dependent on specific platforms. It's going to be Nexus 9K, CloudScale, ASICs, um, EX, FX, FX2, our upcoming GX, and um, there are actually multiple different mechanisms that we use uh, in, in the hardware to collect various data from the data plane. And this will show you that data plane flow information. So it'll show you the path that a particular host-to-host -host conversation um, occurred on. And we can also show you kind of metadata about that path, what was, you know, the overall path latency, what was, you know, were any drops encountered, um, were there bursts, and so forth. And, and so you'll see that in part of the demo. Um, and then also things like hardware statistics and, and data plane events. So uh, we have some mechanisms where we can actually alert off of uh, packets, not just meeting a particular kind of ACL match criteria, but also other criteria like was a particular type of drop seen. In that case, give me the flow data. Uh, was a, a particular threshold like for burst or latency exceeded? And only in that case, give me the flow data. So there's a few different uh, mechanisms that we can use. One thing about the hardware telemetry is this is coming out in essentially a very ASIC specific format. Yes, we can probably just say proprietary. There's no industry standard at the moment for hardware telemetry, although some are kind of forming, I would say. Um, but, you know, this is a very, this is not structured data. This is not a Google protobuf or JSON formatted, you know, text. This is a binary stream coming out of an ASIC with a bunch of hexadecimal numbers uh, representing interface names and queues. And somehow all that needs to get normalized back into something that you as, a, as an operator can actually consume. And that's one of the things that, that NIR actually will do for you. This is actually really not related to this specifically, but since you just mentioned it, are there actually any hardware efforts like, you know, for streaming telemetry to, to standardize sort of like SNMP or SNMP, something like that? I mean, anything that's there, there are, worked on in groups, IEEE, there, IEEE? There are various efforts going on, and Cisco is involved in those, in defining um, 
kind of a, a standard for uh, hardware streaming telemetry. Those are not complete at this point. Um, there are some published architectural papers and white papers around how um, certain vendors, ASIC vendors, have implemented that. Um, we have not published anything that Cisco has done externally. Um, I mean, theoretically we could, but the fact is, is that even between something like an FX and an FX2, which is, I, I assume you guys are pretty familiar with the data center portfolio, it's just two generations of ASICs in the same family. Um, you know, a lot of the format of the data coming out changes just because of the way that they've, you know, changed the floor plan or added memories or moved uh, tables from one part of the pipeline to another. Um, so even if you publish it, it would be just very gnarly for somebody to actually go out and try and build a consumer for this. Um, but in terms of, you know, industry direction, it's definitely moving in that, in that direction. I don't think there's anything in the IEEE. Uh, most of it is more just, uh, um, you know, uh, kind of informational RFCs and so forth about how, how it, it could be done or how we're doing it, but you don't have to do it this way. So, yeah, there's nothing, <laughs> nothing concrete at this point. Yeah, I was curious. Uh, yeah. I mean, it would sure simplify. It would sure simplify a lot of things for. Yeah, it's the wild, wild west right yeah. now, to be honest. Yeah, um, but I'm sure that that will kind of materialize eventually. So this is kind of the overall NIR architecture, and a few things I'll say about it. One is these, you know, this being the sources. These are your switches. We have ingest engines. These are all just containers that suck in all this data, hardware and software telemetry. We do use, you asked about Kafka, we do use Kafka internally as the message bus for all these microservice containers. And so theoretically, we could publish one or more of those Kafka topics externally to the system and you could just suck all the data out of Network Insights resources and put it somewhere else. Right, so if you wanted to do long-term retention beyond the, the stated 30 days or seven days for hardware, um, you could you could subscribe to the Kafka topic for probably you would want post normalized post correlated data, which we have after we've massaged it all, and then you would instead of worrying about all the hardware telemetry format um, and doing any correlations, all that stuff would just be kind of handed to you. That does not that is not exposed today but that is a d directionally where we're going because we have had multiple customers asking, I want to store this off in my own data lake and use it for another application or I want to just have long-term retention. As long as, long as they can touch, touch the message bus for yeah, Kafka, that's exactly. good because yeah. you've already normalized it by the time it goes there. Exactly, right, yeah. So the, the plan is to expose you know, one or more of those topics depending on what the use case is for external consumption. As of now, we do have REST APIs that are supported and available. And so if you wanted to come in and say, you know, show me all the anomalies that have been flagged or something like that, you could do that today. But that's more of an ad hoc use case as opposed to a That's a, report, that's a reporting. That's like a reporting function yeah, as opposed to just a data dump, data, data dump. for retention. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so we pull all that stuff in, we normalize it, we plop it in a data lake. Um, we do all the correlation anomaly detection and so forth, uh, and then we bubble it all up for external consumption. One piece that's really critical here is this telemetry manager, and this goes back to what I was saying about how we manage the switch configuration. So if you've ever looked at the telemetry configuration uh, for streaming software telemetry, I mean, it's, it's pretty long, you know, just kind of like the VXLAN EVPN. It's a long, complex configuration. You're not sure exactly what it is you want to stream. Um, Telemetry Manager takes care of that complexity. It will go out and touch all the switches and push the telemetry config for both hardware and software automatically. If you change some configuration, if you want to add new flow rules, for example, telem Telemetry Manager will make sure and go out and update the, the flow table rules so that we capture the new flows that you're after. So you don't even need to go and touch the switches. Telemetry Manager will take care of that. <clears throat> so with that, Let's see if the demo gods are going to mess with me again here. Make me have a bunch of blank screens in my DCNM. Looks like they are. Okay, here we go. So, first thing I just want to show you the fabric. So, this is my fabric, and um, and this is the, the fabric that we're looking at 
So I have set this up completely with the tools that Lucas already covered. So the easy fabric, all the config is pushed by DCNM. Um, you know, I've defined those fabric settings. It's pushed uh, VXLAN EVPN fabric on top of all this. I, I input very few values here, basically the AS number. I did some manageability stuff like pointing to DNS um, and, and syslog and so forth. I, I'm using POAP, Pope, to bootstrap the switches. So all the configuration from the moment that this thing boots up is being pushed by DCNM. And then I've got three tenants and um, uh, which are the the VRFs, also known as VRFs, and <laughs> oh, and, and the about. networks, right? So there's two, basically two segments in in each of those, um, in each of those, and so uh, this is here. Let me just launch this again, so you see. So I've come to the applications. I basically am launching Network Insights resources, and the first thing again you see. Um, is uh, is the dashboard. So the idea with the dashboard is again to to give you an instant view of is my fabric okay or not. It looks like it's not all all that okay. It's bright red, um, and you kind of see a historical timeline. That by default, I think we go to an hour, but we will change that maybe to like 15 minutes or something just to narrow things down. I've got two spines, four leaf switches. You can see anomalies by type, anomalies by severity. So these are kind of like easy entry points into the data so I don't need to slog around in the tabular data that we have available over here. So most likely you'll come in and you'll say, okay, well, anomalies by severity, there's one critical and five major. That's probably what I want to look at. So I can click through on that critical anomaly. Uh, this one is basically telling me that this switch, spine one, is almost out of space on boot flash. So is that the end of the world? I don't know, it's, it, it, it could be if I need to write a core dump or I need to collect some logging or something, I mean, that, that could be a problem, so. Uh. <laughs> so, assuming your threshold 18, which means that each number is 5%, mm -hmm. that's 90%, okay. and yet your current usage is over 100%. <laughs> Um, 20.03. 20, 20, 0, 0, 20, threshold 18. Okay, yeah. So I'm sure this is some rounding. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> man, Floating point. someone fire up cadets and we'll file, <laughs> file a freaking bug right here. I said freaking. Um, yeah, good catch. I uh, will definitely bring that one up now with our engineers. Thank you. Um, and then... And then maybe once I resolve that and bring it down below, <laughs> you got to eagle eyes. Um, <laughs> I've looked at this like a hundred times in the last two weeks, and it never, I never did the math. Um, and then these are major anomalies. I've got things like, and please don't do the same math here because you'll probably find similar stuff. But um, you know, some some hardware resources are getting heavily utilized, they've reached a threshold, um, and they're alerting on there. And you can actually also see that there's an interface here with the CRC count going up. Um, so, so this is probably the way that you typically would, you know, insert into the data, right, is you would come to the main dashboard, see what's critical, see what's major. Maybe I'll mess around with minor and other stuff later, but um, you probably want to address those red and orange things first. At the same time, you can, you know, browse through to any of the other views, um, and you'll see resource utilization sorted by most to least heavily used. You can also look at kind of a tabular view of that. Um, you know, I can browse by any number <coughs> of different re resources and see, um, well, port use is just kind of goofy, but um, maybe something like uh, the LPM utilization, right? And it will to show you which switches have higher or lower utilization of all those resources. Um, you can kind of see a trending indicator here. Most of these are steady. They're not changing drastically in one direction or another. Um, hardware resources. Uh, and I think here you can see one of these guys has kind of excessive ingress ACL utilization, for example. So that, that may or may not be a problem, uh, but it just kind of alerts you to the fact that, um, you know, that resource is being heavily used. Now, alternatively, you can come in with kind of more of a troubleshooting type mentality where someone calls you on the phone and says, hey, there's some problem. And so I have 
a, a couple scenarios there where you know some this this guy is calling me and, and saying hey there's a problem um, with connection issues you know some vague wonderfully vague uh, comment like that and so it's my job to figure out what's going on so the first thing I can do is so what's the first thing that you typically do when you're debugging a network problem is you're trying you try and find out where this guy is connected in the fabric right so in the old days this would be the old ARP and MAC address table dance and you and use CDP neighbors and figure out where in the L2 network below the AG this guy actually sits in VXLAN eVPN it's even more fun um, you know, this is this is the uh, the IP address, right? So I would do something like a show IP ARP. I, I just picked an arbitrary leaf, um, and he was in verf tenant three, I believe. And I don't have an ARP entry, so he's not directly connected on this switch. So now I have to do something like uh, show BGP L2 EVPN. Um, I think I can just plug the IP address, so I'll limit it to the verf. 10 and 3. Okay, so let me do that one more time just so you can see clearly. Hopefully you can see. So now I know it's connected to some remote VTEP. That remote VTEP that advertised this was 10.2.0.3, right? So now I can do a show IP route for the un in the underlay for that guy. It's two-way ECMP, so I'll pick one of those, one of those spines, which will be spine 1, show IP route, 10.203, and that is learned through Ethernet 1 slash 20, right, or reach through Ethernet 1 slash 20. So now I can do a show CDP neighbors int E120, and it's this guy, which is leaf 5. So now I know he's on leaf 5, show IP ARP, uh, whoops, I know this is really tedious, right? Um, for Ten and three. Okay, we're almost there, guys. Show MAC address address blah. Ethernet one slash two on leaf five. That's how I know where this guy is, right? So that was tedious. There is a better way in DCNM. Did you guess that? Um, we call it the endpoint locator. You can see that it is a screen here in DCNM. And it's showing me all the active end endpoints in my fabric. Um, I can see a network historical view of when hosts came and went. Um, I can see when BGP updates happened. Not that many BGP <laughs> updates happened. Um, you can even search f over the lifetime of an endpoint. But essentially what I want to do is take that IP address, plug it in here. Right away, there's a match. And it tells me all this detail about this host, including the fact that he's in tenant 3, this is the IP to MAC binding, he's on leaf 5, Ethernet 1 slash 2, and VLAN 1303. So instead of all that slogging around in the CLI with L2 EVPN and figuring out underlay versus overlay, this immediately tells you for an overlay connected host where this guy is connected, okay? So leaf 5, Ethernet 1 slash 2. So now I can use the statistics view here in Network Insights resources and say the node, uh, we'll just say contains leaf 5, and the interface equals Ethernet 1 slash 2. And you can see that Ethernet 1 slash 2 is already flagged with a major anomaly. So whatever this guy was complaining about is probably legit because this thing is flagged with a major anomaly. Let's see what that is. It looks like there's actually two anomalies associated with this interface, and one of them, remember we saw those CRC errors. It's, this is the guy who is being hit by all those CRC, CRC errors. There's also some DOM, you know, the transceiver DOM anomaly. So the receive power is above a threshold. So most likely this is like a bad transceiver or a poorly connected. That's a really hot optic. Yeah. What's that? That's a really hot optic. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So. Um, you know, most likely something's wrong with the physical layer here, essentially. We're taking CRCs and this guy is suffering because of it. Now, I, I, in this case, I waited until the guy called, but the fact is if I came into the dashboard and took care of my major anomalies, I probably would have already had an ops guy out there swapping the transceiver or the cable and avoiding 
the case being opened in the first place. No, that was just a warning. That wouldn't be done for like months. So you guys plugged in 80K <laughs> optics and burn them up just for the demo? That was your demo? Uh, I, pl I, I plugged in a Spiron and said generate CRCs, <laughs> basically. Okay. But uh, And the DOM was just an, an added value. I think I have a bad transceiver <laughs> there. ZX but, on one side, SX yeah. on the other, whatever. I have to save that transceiver now as like my, my bad. So question for you on that. Yeah. Like if you had like something like a Mac flap, since you're mapping that all the way down to the endpoint, is that something that would also register as an anomaly? So if you have a Mac flap where you're not expecting it if, on a set of leaves, that you want to go track down? If, so you're talking about seeing a MAC address where, like, flipping back and Right, forth, like you're or, visualizing the path. Yeah, yeah. So let's say I see this MAC address on yeah. one path, and then it suddenly is, you know, coming in on another path, and it's going to register a MAC flap because it's happening in a mm -hmm. certain time interval. Mm -hmm. Is that also something that would register as an anomaly there, like the way the, you know, SFP, uh, SFP being out of spec, or those other alarms we, about registering? We definitely have anomalies around MAC table utilization. A MAC flap... I'm not entirely sure, to be honest, okay. if we would. So, you, but you're basically just saying a Mac move back and forth rapidly between two ports or something. Yeah, like I didn't know what yeah. what you consider an anomaly, like yeah. what's in the database of what we're yeah, yeah. considering an anomaly. That's and, really what it comes down to yeah. is kind of like what they've codified as an anomaly. Um, yeah. And uh, but this is a growing thing. Oh yeah, you guys yeah, are sure. you guys are looking yeah, at it, back. analyzing it. Yeah, and in fact, I mean, the the first part is just to yeah, get the will. data, and we've really not had a platform to co collect this data in a kind of turnkey way. So, you know, the software streaming telemetry, I mean, Jer can attest, we've been shipping this thing for probably four or five years almost, I would say, at least three or four, um, streaming software telemetry. But the question is, who's consuming it, and how do you visualize it and do and also, you know, correlate and do something interesting with it? And we've had a lot of customers attempting to do that. and with varying levels of success, mostly failure, mm -hmm. um, because you know they'll be trying to bring it into an elk stack and do a whole, you know, personalized visualizations based on you know their own kind of algorithms. But um, you know, most customers don't have the expertise or the manpower to do it, and um, and therefore I think the the feature, the capability, is just underutilized. So now we have the data collection platform. We can pull any data that so, can be so is that big data, I was going to ask, because I work in the carrier space a lot, and uh -huh. I've actually seen something similar to this in the ISP space where they say, well, you know, 93 other carriers had this same thing, and this was their spec, and yeah. you're the anomaly. Yeah. So is that is that the, are you guys uh, abstracting that data to use, a, uh, you know, removing personal customer information? Right, right. So you can just look at the anomaly and see the percentages across yeah. enterprises. So I, I would say that kind of herd protection part is more an NIA function than an NIR function at the moment. Okay. Only because, um, you know, there is a cloud connected component. There is the back end, which is all the known issues, which we essentially create a digital signature for all of those known issues and push them down into the system. And so if a new bug comes out next week and it affects other, you know, it affected one customer who had, you know, 93180 FX2s or something, or there's no such switch, but, uh, you know, and you're running that, you would get the benefit of that guy finding it and us digitizing it and pushing it down, be potentially before you ever hit that problem. Okay. In NIR, there is n currently no cloud component at all. We don't push anything anywhere. We don't pull anything from anywhere. Um, so it, it is kind of all a priori, you know, set what the anomaly, anomalies are that we can detect. Um, and certainly a lot of them are based on things we've seen in the past, right? I mean, did, you know, uh, have customers run into X, Y, and Z, we should make sure and collect the right data to get that and then flag that as an anomaly. In the particular Mac flap case, I don't know for sure. I, I'm, I haven't personally ever checked that to see or asked the engineering team. I don't know if anyone well, in the back has Well, part of that, though, would be interesting to see where it comes from, because on that question, really what you were asking, it, it's a switch level thing, mm -hmm. and there's most certainly a syslog message yeah, that yeah. comes up for yeah. it. So the question becomes, how, what, what kind of resources can this learn information from? Yeah. As in, if we point syslog to it for right. you know warnings like that, would that be something that could trigger it or maybe that we could program it to trigger it could is it relative is understood the, yeah <laughs> it's the operative word there yeah so that's certainly possible in fact today you can point your syslog at dcnm dcnm can function function as a syslog mm -hmm. receiver um, as well as an snmp trap receiver um, there's not really any tie-in right now between nir and uh, the syslog 
function on DCNM. That most certainly could be done. I mean, that's simple API calls that could transfer that data between the two kind of uh, yeah. services. The answer um, is not right now. So the answer is not right now, but it's totally doable architecturally. And uh, I mean, it makes perfect sense. And I think we're even asking for some level of, of that integration and in upcoming. Oh, good job. Feature request. Yeah. So we go. <laughs> did have an Our job is question. done. Yes. On, <laughs> yeah. on a dual stack network where you're trying to actually do event correlation between two sets of hosts that mm -hmm or from two different protocol families. Mm -hmm. Like, are you relying on something like Infoblox to put together the that information? Are you guys scraping tables in order to be able to look at like route advertisements and neighbor solicitation tables across the fabric, right? That's gonna exist in different locations. You need a central place to be able to reconcile that. Then you have to match up MAC addresses in order mm -hmm. to be able to understand mm -hmm. that this I mean, there's no is. Infoblox integration at this point. Again, that's probably something that could be done, but it is, is there anything that you guys are doing natively to, in order to be able to give better insight? Because otherwise you're it's just, very hard to track. Like You're just saying like if there's an anomaly against a V4 address blah and a V6 address blah, that there's some it's the way same that host. you know it's the same host who's having a problem. Because exploits could be happening across yeah, two yeah, different yeah. sides. You could have problems across two different sides. The protocol family doesn't matter how right, it's reporting right, it, right? right. So, I, I mean, if it's specifically um, I mean, there's no such mechanism today. Right. Um, they would be treated as independent hosts at that level. Um, Which causes, like, all sorts of namespace problems, right? So yeah. it's like, because it's the same namespace for the host. Right. But it's actually two different identities from a protocol perspective yeah, inside yeah. the tool, which is, like... Yeah, know. I mean, so we can use a V4 and the V6 visibility. I don't think there's any really great that um, stitches correlation together, that stitches right. those two together. I think, again... Um, you know, any anything's possible, and I mean, it makes perfect sense to do it because um, you don't want to be debugging two different problems that end up being the same problem, and you didn't realize it because you know there was no such stitching. So yeah, I think that's valid feedback. Yeah. Uh, Tim. Yeah. Sorry. So there, there is um, the key lookup is Mac. In some of the uh, endpoint, at least endpoint locator right now, the key is Mac. So when you have two IP addresses against the same MAC there, and the same location, the same port, and so on and so forth, we do a correlation there. For the uh, endpoints, which or this, this location function, uh, when it gets paired into network insights, you will benefit from this as well. But right now, it's just individual pieces. Yeah, yeah thanks, Lucas. Um, how, how are we doing on time, guys? So I think we have, maybe I'll show you one more scenario here just to demonstrate the hardware, hardware capability. So this is yet another person calling web connectivity problem for this host in tenant three. So again, I can come over to my endpoint locator. I'm going to spare you the agony of going through the switch tables again. So this guy is connected on leaf one, ethernet one slash one. Um, so in insights, I can again navigate to, uh, this will be... Code contains leaf one, interface equals uh, ethernet one slash one. Oops, I mistyped. And so there are a couple of anomalies here. It's showing that a rate of change for interface utilization is being flagged. So the link utilization went down by more than 10%, um, you know, is that part of the problem? Maybe, maybe not. It's just an informational kind of anomaly. Um, but if you look at the interface, I mean, it looks fairly clean. The, the interface statistics, there's no errors. Um, you know, the DOM stuff looks pretty clean. So then, you know, kind of what do I do next? And this is where our hardware telemetry comes into the picture. So we have the capability to push what we call flow collection rules. And these are essentially ACL matches. For any traffic that matches that ACL, we will collect flow data, uh, which you'll see in a second, um, based on those matches. So in this case, this guy was complaining about web traffic. I've already plugged these in because it does take a minute or two for it to push to all the switches and start showing you the data. So I have the data already coming in. But basically, this is a web, web traffic is the name of the rule. And you can see that it is matching on this host IP as a source with the destination TCP port being 80, which is web. 
and then I have the opposite rule as well, where the source port is 80 and it's um, and it, and the destination is this problem host, right? So I've pushed those rules to the switch. There's a way in DCNM to to see that the rules have been successfully pushed. I, I won't dwell on that right at the moment, um, but I can then come to my flow analytics and I can say um, source address. Oops, source address equals uh, this 177 guy. Uh-oh. Uh oh maybe I'm not looking at current data. There we go. Um, so I can see that flow where this guy is the source. And this is the flow details page for that flow. And you can see the start and the stop time. It's IPv4. It's TCP. No indication of packet drops. Path latency is two microseconds. Um, no indication of the flow moving from path to path. And then you can see the full source and destination, including the VNIs. Um, you can see the packets and bytes. You can even see a burst value, the max burst during the collection duration. There's no anomalies associated with this flow. You can see a path summary for the flow. So it ingressed on leaf one, uh, leaf one Ethernet one slash one, went through spine two, and egressed on leaf two. And then you see some additional details, including um, you know things like latency, burst, drops, flow moves, and packets and bytes, uh, all graphed out for you there. In addition, you can view the reverse path. But in this case, there's no reverse path. That's interesting. So that was one direction of that flow, right? So let's do it with destination address equal to 177. And here I have an informational flow record. And you can see that there are packet drops happening on this flow. So the outbound web connection was fine, but the return trip is having some serious problems. Um, and you can see that we're flagging this as an anomaly. The packet is being dropped by a policy in the network. And in fact, we can show you exactly where that policy is happening. It's on leaf two. Um, so there's some ACL or other policy that is denying that return traffic, right? Um, that would cause a problem with web connectivity. So that's the extent that we show you inside the app as of now. I mean, obviously, I could go now to the switch. Um, I think this was leaf two. Um, you know, so there's a big honking ac access list here. And, you know, now I have to slog through and find maybe uh, where the matching entry is. But you can see that it's denying TCP on port 80 from the destination that this guy was trying to connect to. So this was the destination web server, and it's dropping. So that's a case where the flow data kind of gives you that additional level of visibility where um, you know I, I can plug in specific ACL rules to pull out just the critical data that I need from the network. It goes out and arms all the network devices, basically cranks up the fidelity for the specific problem you're trying to debug, and uh, gives you a pretty good indication of, of what the problem is. So every, everything you're showing right now is based on a leaf spine architecture with uh, VXLAN and mm -hmm. EVPN. Mm -hmm. um, Wait, when you ingest a brownfield network that's still hierarchical yeah. uh, with spanning tree and, and VLANs everywhere, is uh, same same outcome? Um, same. Um, so we have a set of supported topologies that we claim for the flow data. I mean, obviously there's some um, some logic that go is behind you know the whole path stitching and figuring out you know with the flow data coming from multiple different switches is this the same flow. Um, and so there are specific supported topologies. VXLAN, EVPN, SpineLeaf is definitely one of them. Um, we also 
support, though, a traditional hierarchical L2, L3 with VPC, for example, um, and there's some other topologies as well. I, I, I will say it's not every single topology that you could conceivably come up with for, for the flow data. I mean, for software telemetry, it's not really a big problem because it's mostly a, a single device view. Um, so as long as the devices are IP reachable by insights, then we can show them and, and collect the data for them. The path stitching is where, you know, we need to uh, craft the logic to stitch the flows, and then we need to obviously fully QA all those different topologies and make sure that it, it works as expected. And so that's why um, it's not just any arbitrary topology and we can do it for you. But if there's specific, you know, if there's a specific customer scenario that we, you know, need to address, we can always visit that independently um, as it comes up. But we're we're targeting, you know, kind of the 80-20 in terms of topological uh, variation, and then the 20 is going to have to, you know, maybe be a little more tailor-made over time. <laughs>